Virtual Machine Sequence Part 3. This is where we left the video narration of the project in the last video. We had just added a few more steps that it would clear out B3 Word 10, binary file 3 Word 10, so you could start with another part. There were a number of questions in the manual and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of reading to do to get to the next section to where we added a couple more improvements before we moved on to another style of programming. One of the one of the cleanups that we added, and this would only be discovered, uh, it's hard to discover this with a virtual process because you're not really looking at the, pr the process. What you see in your head you know, it depends on your ability to visualize in 3D and motion to visualize the actual process. If you don't have that skill, you can develop it. A lot of people will say, if you don't have that skill, you'll never have it. I don't buy that. If you set and work at visualizing something in three dimensions that's stationary, something simple. Start with a carton, a corrugated carton with the flaps open then visualize them closing, visualize them being folded, and just keep working on your ability to visualize obvious things in animated 3D, and you'll get to the point where you can visualize almost anything, even very complex things. So this particular fix, and that is that if the finished product conveyor is running, we don't want Cylinder 3 to extend and push another part out onto it because Picture in your mind the conveyor is running. Finished product conveyor belt is running. You push a part out. And even though the pusher has a little uh, V block, a slight V cut into it to center the part, the conveyor is still going to possibly grab it out of the pusher and it'll rotate out of position. And instead of being centered on the finished product conveyor, it will be to the far edge because it was rotated out of the V block on the end of cylinder 3 extend. So we don't want cylinder 3 to extend if the finished product conveyor is running. So we just throw that in there as an unconditional condition. So these conditions are still the main conditions, but this is an additional one. And of course, this is only going to be temporary. Once the finished product conveyor stops, then you can push the part out. That's simple. And then another uh, change that we made, which is down here, and that is that the cylinder 3 had to be retracted in order to start the finished product conveyor. So we don't want to start the finished product conveyor unless cylinder 3 is completely retracted. That wasn't a change. We were just pointing out some of this um, reasoning and keep in mind when when you're out there working on something uh, you will over a period of time gain a real intimate visual of the processes that you're working on so you could actually sit someplace in a break room or uh, at your desk or a workbench and work on the code because you can vis visualize the process remember that we're we're discussing at this point, how do we get more than one part in process in station one? In other words, how do we allow more parts to come off of the feed conveyor while there are still parts that have not passed cylinder five stop number two to go on downstream? Once they've left that point, they're well out of station one. They're, they're still under the influence of the finished product conveyor, which is under the influence of a downstream call. But how do we allow more parts to be in there? Well, some of the problems that we have is that we don't have enough sensors. And you might say, well, why don't you just use more I.O. or use more B3 bits and have them be sensors? Well, what you're going to find in the real world is most material handling, and that's kind of what this is, and machines are made by the lowest bidder. 
And one way that machine builders and material handling companies can get the contract is they only put in the minimum amount of hardware to satisfy the functional spec. So when they show up and commission it, the customer might, might say, well, uh, we would rather that it did this and did that. You'd say, well, that wasn't in your functional spec. So as long as it meets the functional spec, then the, the job is commissioned, the customer has to pay. And if they want something different, you do something called a ECO, Engineering Change Order. And that's where a lot of companies make their money is on the ECOs. They'll underbid the job knowing full well they can read the functional spec and see that it's not good enough. They know the functional specification is not good enough. So they will quote the project, underbid it. In other words, they know that they're not going to make any money on the initial project. But they will make money on all the fixes in order to make it work because the customer didn't write a good functional spec. So the what I'm getting to is you're going to find lots of places where you wish there was more photoized proxies, etc., and there are not. So we'll, we're going to treat one of those right now. So we start rung six when we said that cylinder three was extended, and we're going to do a little delay and then retract cylinder three. We're going to unlatch output one. Notice that I added a latch B320 slash four, and I named it part at cylinder three into stroke. Now in your manual it might have been part at cylinder three extended, same thing. Uh, since then I, I've adopted EOS into stroke, that's just simpler. So part at cylinder three into stroke. Now it could be extended into stroke, but you get the point. There's a part there. And we know there's a part there because we pushed one out there. In other words, if there was not a part to push out, we wouldn't be this far. Now we'll probably add some more of these at end of stroke bits that says there's the part there. So we're going to turn this bit on and say there's a part at the end of stroke cylinder three, which means out on the finished product conveyor. If you drop down two rungs to rung number eight, this is how we're going to unlatch that bit. Well, if we're going to declare there's a part at the end of stroke of cylinder three, then we got to have some way to unlatch that bit to say it's not there anymore. So if you look at rung eight, you can see it's real simple. If a part arrives at photo I3 through a one shot and the finished product conveyor is running, the only way that could happen, this is the leading edge of input two. In other words, the part the instant that it broke the optical path of PE3, that's the leading edge. It goes from false to true. We one shot, and if the finished product conveyor is on, then we declare that the part left, end of stroke, cylinder three, and we unlatch it. That's simple. You're going to see a lot of logic like this, not only in what we're doing, but out in the field. We also had you add a, an additional action for the reset push button. You don't have to use the reset push button. This is put in for your convenience while you're learning. So if you mess it up, in other words, you forget to turn photo eyes off on whatever, and you just mess up the whole thing, put all the inputs off and hit the reset button, input five, and that'll clear everything. And you could keep adding stuff, you know, branch arounds, clear, 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 unlatch, move. You can put whatever you want in here when you reset. And keep in mind, as I said in the manual, you can go off on your own at this point and create your own logic. You don't have to follow what we're doing. I would advise you to follow what we're doing and then go back and change it. You know, maybe make notes. I'd like to try this. Go back. You know, I mean, this is your code. Time permitting, if you're in a live class and you're ahead of the game here, by all means, implement some of your thoughts. Next thing we had you do, now remember, what we're discussing right now is how do we get more parts into the station without the part that's finished having completely exited? Well, looking at the first one here, station 1 1, well, that has to be unlatched when the part gets to the next point. So if you look at the second rung here, rung 3, 
When we latch bit 2 of B310, we unlatch the previous bit, bit 1 of B310, and we did the same thing. In other words, you can't re-execute this rung or any of these rungs until you've unlatched them. So we had to go down and do that on every, on every rung. Latch 3, unlatch 2. Latch 4, unlatch 3, and so forth. All the way down, and I went all the way down to uh, bit 12. Now I didn't do bit 13 because when this is on, then it clears B310, so it clears itself. Okay, now the, the only reason for doing this is so you can free up the logic to receive the next part. There's more problems to it than just this. Okay, but for now, logically, this is would be your pursuit. If you were using latch type logic, well, okay, I got to go unlatch everything. Remember I told you earlier, when you use latches, you have to unlatch the whole world. One other thing that I did was I had you put in what I call a, a poor man's HMI. And this is a rung or two that allows you to watch the state of what steps have completed as you're running. You could just sit here and watch these two rungs and see it progressing through the code. Okay, so let's download and try this out. You, you may have done this online. Everything that we just did could have been done online. However, I'm sure you found by now that when you do online editing, it takes longer because there, it's a three-step process to get rid of the edit zones. You have to accept it, and then you have to test it, and then you have to assemble it. So if I've got, you know, a handful of edits to make, I just save it, go offline, make the changes, and then download it. It's a time saver. So here we are downloaded, and remember, we're heading towards a goal of getting a second part into the system before the first part is completely out. So you shouldn't, if, if you're expecting this to work completely at this point, because we unlatched all the bits, you, you might be disappointed. So let's do this thing. We're waiting for a new part, and of course, as it latches it right, right away, it moves in. Uh, 5003 says, okay, this part needs executed, and the part uh, passes on by, and eventually, and notice up here that this is now on. We've latched bit 1 of B310. So now we get to PE2, and we're going to extend cylinder 1, cylinder 2, and once it's extended, then we're going to turn on the drill motor. You see it stepping right through, right? Step 6. Step 7, step 8, step 8, step 8. <laughs> so you could be looking here or you could scroll down here. Part at cylinder 3 into stroke. Okay. 1 and 2 are off. Let's turn on 3. That's going to extend. If we jump back up to the top to look at our poor man's HMI, we're still on step eight. So we go back down. We don't have a downstream call, so we extended cylinder five. Cylinder five is extended, so we're good. We're, we're actually good. Except that we, we want to turn off the finished product conveyor. Up here is where we latched it on. It's, this rung is false, so it's not relatching it. We're just not unlatching it. So in order to get the finished product conveyor to stop, we would have to edit this wrong. Actually, this worked out pretty good considering the only thing that we did was we unlatched the latched bits behind us as we go. But you see there's a, a few flaws here. One is right now we've extended cylinder 5, but we did not turn off the finished product conveyor. So we might just leave that as it is right now and toggle on the downstream call. So now we have a downstream call. One of the changes I made in the manual was when step 9 is complete and we're, let's say we're into step 10, this instruction used to be outside here. I moved it in here so it only affects the finished product conveyor and not these steps. And when I did that, 
Then it stepped right on through because remember there's no time delays in here, no cylinders moving. It stepped right on through to step 12. But the finished product conveyor is still running because remember that if we have a downstream call then the conveyor is going to keep running. So I'll turn off right now we're in step 12. I'll turn off that downstream call and you see it goes all the way through and clears. So again this logic is not perfect by any stretch of the imagination but we don't want to spend too much time perfecting something that we're going to turn around and redo anyway with a more effective method of controlling this process. So next I had you try putting in multiple parts. So let's toggle in a part and when it's uh, well received then we'll let it step into station 2. Once it's in there we'll turn off PE2 and let it go through as far as it can go which should be waiting for PE3. And I, I do believe that is in step 8. So if I turn on PE3 and let's go down and see what it's doing. We remove this part and here's where we're sitting. We extended 5. Okay, we're not going to do 9 until we get a downstream call. So if we get a downstream call, no, we'll leave it set right there. We'll leave it set right there in front of um, photo I3 and we'll go back up here and we'll try putting in another part. So I'm going to turn on PE1 again. See it's going through reading the barcode reader. It's going to extend cylinder 1, cylinder 2. Oh, there's PE2. Now it'll extend cylinder 1 and cylinder 2. And we are down to station 5 having completed and the finished product conveyor is running so it won't extend cylinder 3. To, if we turn off the downstream call, which I think is off, go down and look to see finished product conveyor. Downstream call. We need a downstream call. Let's see what happens up here. Okay, now we're in 5 and 12. So we got two parts in there. One at 5. And it's waiting for the print finished product conveyor to come back on. So let's just assume that uh, the part cleared PE3 for the downstream call. Okay, then we would need to turn off the finished product conveyor. And to do that, we would have to complete 9, which means, see, we have a problem here. So we need to go back to extend cylinder 3 extend solenoid right here in this rung rung 7 and we need to add in not only is the finished product conveyor not running we don't want cylinder 3 to extend if there is a part at cylinder 3 extended so we do a truth off and then we find the code right here and you can cursor hold it down and scroll up and drop it there. You gotta be careful when you're doing that because any of those red memes, if they turn green and you let go, that's where it goes and it could wipe out something else. So maybe that wasn't an expedient, expedient method of showing you that you would have been better off just to type in B320 slash 4. Okay, so this, if there's already a part at cylinder 3 into stroke, then you can't extend cylinder 3. Now, this would be a photo eye. It, or it should be a sensor. It should be a photo eye. So the photo eye tells you there's a part there. Don't extend with another new part, you know, finished part, because you'll push the first one off onto the floor, right? Across the conveyor and off onto the floor. The next changes that we had you make, rung three here, and two of them here. One is that once we've used N70, remember N70 comes from our barcode scanner. So we, we put a value in to N70, but that value stayed there. We don't want it to stay there once it's been used. So as soon as we latch 
bit one of B310 and extend our cylinder one and two, we clear N70 because it's been used. It was only needed to latch on this bit right here. The other thing we do is when we extend cylinder one and two, see they're both extended here, we latch a bit that says there's a part at cylinder two in the stroke. So now we have two virtual sensors, one for cylinder two end of stroke and one for cylinder three end of stroke. And of course, when this one leaves this position, so picture this, this is where the hole gets drilled in it. So if we want to unlatch this bit when this part leaves that position, we go down to where we extend cylinder three right here. When we extend cylinder three, then when it's retracted, actually, we could put this right here. Would be more, more appropriate down here. Because here's where we actually retract cylinder three. We'll do it there. We're doing this on the leading edge of cylinder three retracted prox. And how do we accomplish leading edge? With a one-shot instruction. Because this is only going to be true when this goes from false to true. So that meant cylinder three was not retracted, but then when it came back and hit the retracted prox, we one shot it through and unlatched the part at cylinder two into stroke. So see how we're going back and we're kind of tidying up what we left behind. And this is typically how you write code. You write code just to get one part through it. And then you got to get two parts through it when the first part's not all the way through. You just keep going back and re adding things and cleaning things up until you get it to where you want it. Then we also added some logic to fix something that's been plaguing us, and that is the, the finished product conveyor kept running after we extended cylinder five. So it's simple. You just go and throw in a branch around, unlatch B320 slash two if you extend the solenoid. I added another wrong, and this was just after the really the the first rung in the logic that gives us our barcode trigger and decides that this part needs a hole board in it. We have a little something extra here to unlatch it, not waiting for this unlatch down here. And it basically says is if it's latched and photo I2 is triggered, then one shot this, but don't unlatch it unless there's the part already at cylinder two end of stroke. And this basically catches a little physical problem. I mean, we're, our virtual machine is perfect, right? I mean, there is nothing that needs adjusted physically. The photo eyes are in perfect position to eliminate any kind of nonsense of an accidental triggering because of some other object that's gets in its way that's part of the machine. That's all this rung does. It was something that I noticed when I was operating the sequence. Now the real crux of the biscuit here, I mean the moral of this whole story is when you unlatch, when you latches, then you have to go back and you have to unlatch the whole world. That's why I hate latches. I mean they're great if you got to use them and when you first start writing code you're going to use latches, I'll guarantee you. <laughs> you're going to give up on some things and you're going to use a latch and then later on you might say, oh I see now I could do that and you go back and change it to seal in logic so it's a lot easier to drop out. When you latch bits and then sequence them, they become interdependent. They are dependent on each other. And if you write code with seal in, you can write each rung as a standalone thought that encompasses any possibility. Moving on. Yeah, the rest of the time in this project, you went through and you tested. If you found things that didn't work, you should troubleshoot it and get it to work if you've got time. If you're ahead of everyone else in the class, you got time to play with this and tidy up anything left that you don't like. But this, we're not going to continue any further using latch-unlatch logic. We're going to step on to something else. 